Okay, hello Ollie. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, interview for an undergraduate place on the biology course at Oxford. Um, so what we're going to do today is firstly we need to tell you that obviously this is an online interview and if anything does go wrong with your internet connection or if you can't hear us or see us don't worry you're not being tested on how good your internet connection is um, just let us know ask us to repeat if you need to and if we do need to reorganize this interview we absolutely can do so please don't worry about that side of things so what we're going to do we're going to ask you um, some questions just to probe your biological thinking so please do just think out loud and um, feel free to ask us questions at any point during the interview, but there also will be an opportunity to ask specific questions at the end as well. So to introduce ourselves, so I am Dr. Beth Mortimer. I'm a research fellow in the zoology department and I am a uh, retained lecturer at Pembroke College and joining us is my colleague Rob. Good morning, Ollie. Pleasure to meet you. My name is uh, Rob, Dr. Rob Salgaro Gomez. I am also uh, a faculty member at the Department of Zoology with Beth, and I am a tutorial fellow at Pembroke College. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> Lovely to meet you, Ollie. So oh, we're going to start off with a very uh, big question to begin with for us for everyone is why do you want to study biology um okay so i think that um i've always been interested uh in things that are quite complex um in things which don't necessarily have a straightforward answer um and there's different sides of things and um i suppose there's lots of subjects like that uh, that I've experienced going through school, but biology always seemed like something that was you know, really complex. It was um, sort of the, the highest level of uh, organization, if you like. Um, and also, so that, that interest in things that are really convoluted with um, the fact that it's just all around you, like you can walk down the street and you see the trees and you see the birds and, and um, you see nature all around you like just having having that with you on a day-to-day -day basis and being able to understand it through studying biology i just find that really rewarding um and so i think for, for quite some time during school um that the more i kind of engaged in biology the more i got enjoyment out of um learning about it and, and experiencing it hands-on um so, so yeah, I, I think that's that's the, the main reason why. Great, thank you. And are, are you interested in any particular part of biology or, or would you say you're looking forward to kind of the overview of lots of different topics? Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm quite interested in lots of different aspects of biology. Um, I've really enjoyed a lot of the molecular biology things that we've done at A-level. Um, and also, but also a lot of the organismal uh, biology and ecology. Um, so yeah, I'm quite broad. Um, I, I really enjoy evolution, but of course, evolution um, feeds into all different parts of biology. So I think, um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty broad, and that's one thing I liked about really, really broad. If I may ask, Oli, I'd like to, to follow up on that question asking you about from all the, the broad repertoire of aspects in biology that you have already studied, is there perhaps a species or a taxonomic group or perhaps uh, a kind of ecosystem that you feel particularly attracted to because you find it more interesting? And, and if so, why, why that one? Um, so I think that I quite, I quite like plants. Um, so last year I went on um, a plant identification course, which I found really rewarding. Um, so just the ability to to go out and, and take like an, an identification key and, and uh, ID all these plants and then learn how uh, they're working, uh, their physiology and at the molecular level, 
um, in school. I, f- I find that really cool. So I think that I, but I also find animals fascinating and, and microbes. So, um, but yeah, I think that that uh, that experience that I've had with plants gives me a little bit of a soft spot for them, maybe. Fantastic. Thank you for that. No Great. Problem. Thank you, Ollie. What we're going to do now is I'm going to share my screen with you. And if you can confirm when you can see the screen, that would be great. I'm going to play a video to you, a video of some animals. I'm going to play it twice. And after I've played it twice, if you can just describe what you see. OK, OK, great. Right. I'm going to play the video now. And as I say, I'll play it twice. And after that, I'll just ask you to describe what you've seen. Okay, that's the end of the video. I'm going to play it again. Great. Would you like to describe what you've seen, Ali? Okay. So uh, there was there was a group of ele- of elephants. Um, so the some of them seemed to be adults, and I think there were a couple of calves. I think that's what a baby elephant's called. Um, and they 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 were all sort of huddled together in a group, at least at the start. Um, under a tree, so they, it looks like they were they were um, just taking shade, maybe from um, from the sun, um, cooling off. Um, a lot of them seem to be flapping their ears quite a bit. I don't know whether that might be for ventilation or something. Um, and then towards the end, uh, one of the adult elephants um, left the group, and um, a few of the calves followed and I think another one of the adult elephants followed as well um, so it seemed like towards the end of the group was starting to disband um, for, for one reason or another. Great yeah a really good description of the video there how how would you summarize the change in behavior do you think? Well I think at, at the start it seemed like um, they were just kind of stood like ventilating it seemed like they or I don't know whether they were ventilating or it seemed like they were they were um, just trying to, to cool down and um, they, they were investing their energy um, or should I say their time into um, to that rather than, than foraging and then maybe when they were breaking off they were going to do some foraging behavior or something like that. Um, it, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not really sure. Yeah, don't worry. So that there was a point in the video where the elephants kind of froze and they mm-hmm. kind of stuck their ears out and it looked to me like it was a kind of um, listening behaviour, you might say. Okay. So there was these changes in behaviour that we could see um, that suggest that they might have noticed something. And then, as you say, they left at the end. So what do you think might explain those sequence of behaviors so maybe they were like i say originally they were out listening for um it could be some kind of predator or i mean i think um i've been to herbivores so um I, I i don't think they'd be they'd be looking out for any particular prey um but kind of like maybe like um yeah so looking out for a predator and then they they or should I say listening out for a predator and then they heard something that might indicate that there is a danger um, and then they they followed that um, or, or maybe, maybe it was um, maybe it was some kind of human disturbance as well um, so maybe they heard some kind of um, vehicle or something and that, that as, a, as a group um, the, the adults then decided that 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 
that could potentially be harmful to the group. So then they, they led um, especially some of the young calves away. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Ali. So there really you've got two hypotheses haven't you, for the change in behaviour that was observed. So you've said maybe that they heard or had some kind of uh, acoustic stimulus which they associated with a predator or maybe even a human. So would you like to pick one of those? And then if you'd like to tell me how you might test that hypothesis in the field. So with wild elephants. OK, um, so let's say maybe it's humans so maybe like like poachers I'll, I'll, ch I'll choose that one um so to test the hypothesis of whether they um did this kind of behavior that listen out and then then disband in response to human noise um maybe you could have separate groups of element of, of elephants and um one group you could observe and make the noise um, and see how they respond. Um, and another group you could observe not make the noise and then compare okay, just, them. Just to be clear, what would your noise be? So let's say it's uh, the, the revving of an engine. So maybe from like um, the kind of truck that poachers might use. Yeah, um, but I mean, if, if you were going to test this to make it as controlled as possible and remove bias, then um, you'd want to um you'd want to keep as many other conditions uh the same as possible so maybe you'd want to do this at the same time of day um you'd you'd probably have to use different herds of elephants because um if you use the same herd more than once then they might react differently a second time great so it's you've got a treatment you have a comparison so i think you said your comparison was to no noise and then you want to keep conditions similar um, what about sample size? Okay, so uh, you probably want quite a big sample size um, so that it's more reliable. Um, so you'd repeat this experiment quite a lot of times um, at similar times of day um, so that um, because that, that makes it more uh, accurate. Um, Great. And as you said, maybe thinking about not using the same herds uh, more than once. Great. Those are all really, really good thoughts for how, how we would test this. So just, just to wrap up this question. So if I had played this video to you with the sound on, what you would have heard when they started kind of freezing and looking forward was actually the sound of bees. So um, these elephants uh, respond to the sound of bees and they, they retreat. From them so this is a natural response uh, that they have is that a response that you might expect in an elephant well i i didn't know that elephants really interacted with bees very much i mean maybe they maybe they don't maybe it's some kind of indirect indicator to the elephant or um or maybe uh bees are a bit of a danger to to elephants um or it like because they could sting them or, um, no, or, or maybe yeah they, they can fly into their ears and on their trunks as well so they they do have soft places where they can be harmed by the bees um well thank you so much ollie um what we're going to do now is i'm going to hand over to rob and he's going to ask uh, a different question for you so thank you thank you very much beth thank you ollie can i please confirm with you can you can you hear me okay yes fantastic so very much like my colleague i'm also going to attempt to share something Perhaps in your education so far in learning about ecology and evolution, you will have learned that the ways in which different individuals from different species maximize their fitness is by uh, making compromises. Energy is limiting, so they have to make a compromise regarding how well they survive and how much and how often they reproduce. So based on this logic, a rather sizable body of literature within biology named life history theory has made a prediction. And the prediction is that if you were to quantify how much individuals within a population invest on their own survival or reproducing, that is contributing to the next cohorts, you should find a really strong negative correlation, like the one shown on the graph. So 
So on the, on the x-axis, you have how much each individual represented by a blue dot is allocating to its own survival. And on the y-axis, you have how much that individual is investing not on itself, but into the new um, generation, new, new offspring. The, the theory predicts this. The theory predicts a negative correlation. And the theory predicts that those correlations should be universal. Wherever you look for them, you should find them. Interestingly, though, when we go to the field and we try to quantify reproduction and survival from individuals in a natural population, we find something like this. So we are often lucky when we can find a negative correlation between reproduction and survival. And you can see here, this correlation is negative, but it's, on, it's only weekly. So because there's a lot of deviation from the predicted negative slope, right? And what's more, oftentimes we even find the reverse. We sometimes find a positive correlation between investments in survival and investments in reproduction within the same population. So the question to you is, there's a theory and there's an observation. Where do you think that mismatch might be coming from? So, so, the, so the theory is the negative correlation, um, but we often see like maybe a really weak negative or like no correlation or even a positive uh, between survival and reproduction. A lot of the the theory when we try and um, we use maths to to calculate it, it's quite clear cut. Um, but then when when we're in the field, there's a lot of um, variation. Mm. Parameters, so so maybe variation in the environment. Um, so did, you said that each of these points are individuals. Yeah, they are individuals of the same population, by which it's understood that these are individuals that share the same space, more or less, the same part of the landscape. And obviously, because of the same population, they interact in in space in space and in time. So maybe. Um, these individuals uh, vary more in yep. um, like um, or, or maybe the, the resources differ that uh, each individual can get so yep. I suppose if if you did have if each individual had the same number of resources then they'd be able to um, like the more they invest in their own survival, the less they could invest in their offspring. Um, but if like, because of course, like certain individuals um, just will, will happen to be able to get more, uh, more resources than others. So um, yep. or, more or less, so then some can invest a lot in survival and, 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 and a bit in reproduction, Absolutely. others can't invest much in either. Um, so therefore, like that, you don't get that really nice, strong negative yeah. correlation. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you got that absolutely correct, Oli. So the, the theory, the original theory, which is the first slide that we have here, only explicitly speaks about investment of the energy, but didn't take into account how that energy is acquired. And by talking about the fact that different individuals might perhaps have different efficiencies in acquiring resources, one can in fact um, come up with a framework where the true trade-offs, these energetic compromises between investing in survival and reproduction do emerge. So what you have here is pretty much the same graph as before, okay? Where now the individuals have been color-coded according to their degree of competitiveness. That is, how good are they at extracting resources? Are they more competitive in the case of green, uh, high competitiveness degree? That's, that's green. So you can see that those individuals are displaced towards the top right of the, of the graph, right? So those are individuals that invest more in survival and they also invest more in reproduction because they are better at obtaining more resources. They have got more energy. Flip side of the coin, you've got individuals marked in red, low competitors that uh, don't invest much in survival, don't invest much in reproduction because they don't have much to invest, right? Okay, so let me take you, let me take you back from this rather abstract concept that is investments 
in in different um, fitness components of survival and reproduction. And I'm going to pretend now that you are my principal investigator. So you're now my boss, Oli. You lead a research group. You've recently gotten a really sizable research grant, say a million pounds, that is going to allow you and your team, congratulations, obviously, that is going to allow you and your team to fly to the plains of Africa to evaluate whether this theory attains if it's pertinent for lion populations, okay? So you've got pretty much unlimited resources, yourself and your team, to quantify trade-offs between survival and reproduction in a lion population. What kinds of things would you want me as your research assistant to collect for you? What kind of data do you need? Okay, um, so, so essentially, um... We need data to be able to draw a kind of graph like this. Um, so for a set of individuals, um, you'd want some kind of indication of their survival um, and also of their reproduction. So I suppose for survival, um, you'd have to see um, whether they're surviving from one year to the next or or throughout a particular um a particular length of time so maybe you'd have to keep going back out there um mm -hmm. and seeing how old individuals are, are getting and um and I, sp I suppose as well they'd have to be this the same individuals so you'd have to have a way of um knowing which individuals are which uh, yeah. I don't know whether li lions have some kind of um, ID, um, like some some way of identifying them. I know like zebras, you can identify them as individuals by their stripe patterns. Um, but I, sp I suppose if yeah, if, so that's if, that's a really good idea. In some in some species, identifying individuals is is quite easy because they have got very specific features. Uh, the tail of whales sometimes can be used to identify. Um, without any kind of mistake, what individual you're referring to here. Uh, for the lion population, for this imaginary lion population, let us imagine that, of course, there's going to be cubs, there's going to be the male, there's going to be uh, the pride, right, with females, but we're not really able to identify them with our naked eyes. So what kinds of things might you want to consider to be able to, to follow them through time, as you mentioned, for survival? So I, I think I've seen this done in turtles like maybe you could add some kind of tag so either like a, a physical tag that you like attach i mean that might be quite logistically difficult with a lion um so you could like add a tag to their to their ear or something that's not gonna harm their chances of survival um yep. or you could you could maybe put some um I forgot what they're called, but some kind of like digital tag under yep. their skin. So then you can um, detect them with like a scanner. I, th I think, I, yeah, I think yeah. I've seen that done before. Yeah, definitely. Of it's... course, of course, there will be there will be some bioethical implications to this, but because you have got a really sizable grant and you're a leader in the field, you've made sure to obtain all the clearance and you've surrounded by self with the appropriate veterinary permissions to be able to do that kind of work, right? To to put them to sleep for half an hour, put the tag, and then just follow them through time, right? So in regards to survival, I think that that would be doing the job. What about reproduction? What would you do? Um... So I suppose reproduction for each individual, you need to take into account um, how many offspring they're having um, each time that they reproduce, but also like um, how many times they reproduce. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe maybe for, for lions, um, because they give birth to, to live young, like um, you'd have to... Uh, find some way of keeping track of which offspring in a pride belongs to which lions, so which which males and which females. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how you do that. Maybe you'd have to like observe them for um, 
for this, like an extended period of time or something. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose if I've, I've got loads of money, I can do that. Um, I suppose you do, indeed. Now you've you've talked about the linkage between the cops and the and the mothers, right? What about the father? How would you be able to identify how much a lion, a male lion, is investing into reproduction? Let me let me complicate the picture a little bit more. Imagine that there's been a male lion that has been reproducing with the females in the pride for a few years, but he's getting old and a new juvenile has come into the pride and has actually kicked him out. So how do we evaluate the investment in reproduction of the new cubs? We're not completely sure a priori who the father is. So maybe you could take some kind of DNA sample mm -hmm. um, from the cubs and from the father. Um, and I suppose you could do something like DNA fingerprinting um, to determine whether they share different particular alleles. Mm -hmm. um, and that could give you an indication of who the cubs belong to. I mean, again, this would yeah. probably take quite a long time, um, but that would give you an indication of um, who the cubs belong to. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether that would directly in indicate um, investment in, in reproduction, because I, I, I suppose that some cubs could have died um, or um, like I know that as well when an, I, th I think I, I read somewhere that when a new um, male lion enters a pride he often kills cubs yep. Um, yep. so that's why like long-term observation could be quite important. Indeed, indeed. And obviously one of the things that you mentioned before when trying to, to examine the existence of trade-offs between survival and reproduction is that it's not only about energy expenditure, right? It's also about energy acquisition. So you've talked about how to quantify investments that is expenditure in survival, investment in reproduction, right? What about energy acquisition? What would you do? Um, so like, I suppose to, to find out how much energy each of the different lines are getting, you could, um, um, I mean, I suppose you could like try and find some kind of biomass estimate, but I, mm -hmm. I suppose like as they use more energy, like some might be more active than others, so that might not be a direct indicator. Um, or you could try and estimate how much food, uh, mm -hmm. so how many um, antelopes or whatever the lion's eating, like how, how many how much um i mean it doesn't again like it doesn't seem like a super accurate way of estimating the resources available to the line but um yeah, yeah. but getting getting a sense of you know how many resources each individual is consuming which of course you identify will be tricky right it's, it's just being done at every really course level at the moment and uh, the females kill in group, right? And then they share the, the, the food. So doing this really fine tune will require quite a bit of work, but that's why the the UKRI, one of the big funding agencies of the UK has given you this big grant to look into that, right? So thank you so much for your, for your answers to my many questions. And now I think I'm gonna pass it back to my colleague, Dr. Mortimer. Thank you. Hi, Ollie. Thanks. So that is the end of the detailed questions that we were going to ask you. So now is an opportunity that if you do have any questions for us, uh, you're very welcome to ask them. Um, yeah, OK, so, so just one. Um, what I've heard about in the perspectives that there are like tutorials um, and I've heard that these like are quite a big part of biology at Oxford. Um, how, how do they work? Yeah, great question. And tutorials really are something that's um, very special to um, the, the Oxford course and the biology course. Um, so the, the way that they work is they tend to be organised uh, in the first year by your college. So whichever college you're at, you're at, you'll tend to get tutorials with other people studying biology in your year. 
And very similar to this interview, it really is a discussion for usually about an hour. Usually you've prepared something beforehand. So usual in biology, you might be set a question and a reading list, and you'll then prepare an essay. Uh, on that topic. You might sometimes get what's called a problem sheet, so a series of kind of smaller problems as well. So you know something about the topic before you come into the tutorial. And then really it's um, a discussion very similar to this where we ask you questions and you think out loud. And usually these are in very small groups. So that's what un is unusual about tutorials at Oxford. So often it will be two students and one tutor, but could be a few more than that as well. Um, Rob, anything to, to add about tutorials? That was a perfect definition. I don't think I could have explained that any better. It's, it's just a unique opportunity to engage with academics who have been thinking for a long time and really deeply about specific areas. And because our faculty is so diverse in the case of biology, it entails experts in plant sciences and zoology as well. Um, it really gives you the opportunity to get to know what's the most avant-garde aspect of whatever area within biology and to have this intimate connection with with that leader and it's worth saying from second year upwards it's not just set uh, within your college so you will always get the expert for that particular topic giving you the tutorial so you don't need to bear this in mind when you're uh, picking your college but from second year onwards you pick the tutorials uh, that you want to give so you can follow your interests and of course your college tutor is there to advise you and uh, have an overview of your academic development Great, I hope that answers your question, Ollie. Yeah, well, thank you thank so you. much for your time today. Uh, it's thank been a you, pleasure Ollie. to talk to you about biology. And um, yeah, what will happen next is often you will get another interview at another college. Um, but for now, uh, yeah, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you, Ollie. We wish you all the best. Thank you.